Goalies, hockey parents, coaches, to those who just love the game of hockey and want to know a little bit about what those guys do standing at the end of the ring. Welcome to In Goal Radio. I'm Darren Millard, and the podcast has arrived. Today, we'll cover Russian goaltending from a most unexpected form, a blossoming story with the Blues that just continues to gain momentum, and we have a Bob Versi in Columbus. Gear Geeks, we're going to chat with one of the most significant people on the equipment side of the game. Sonia DiBiase is going to join us. CCM Brand is our focus today, and it's a fascinating interview. You won't believe where modern goal pads got their start and their inspiration. One has to do with, uh, can I mention lanocaine? Maybe maybe uh, an, something that, that takes away the allergies? Uh, you're going to have to stick around for it. Plus, Roberto Luongo goes for a car ride with our own Kevin Woodley as he discusses where he got his start in goal and what his future is as he winds down his career and my own observations. Uh, it's going to be a fun opening major episode. This is really episode number one. So let's bring in the founders, the owners, the operators, the contributors uh, to In Goal Magazine, Kevin Woodley and David Hutchinson as we go coast to coast. I'm at the East Coast office looking out over the North Humberland Strait in Prince Edward Island. And David, you are in Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island, lovely Nanaimo. It's a little bit uh, warmer here than it is for you. Yeah, there's no ice there. <laughs> I can walk once a year. Brunswick. Once uh, a year. Kevin Woodley, how are you? I'm good. From from the suburbs of Vancouver where uh, the weather is bordering on uh, golf on a Sunday afternoon kind of thing. Sorry, Derek. Well, you, 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 you're not doing that here. But, you know, every now and then I like a good blast of winter weather just to remind me that it is a, is it a hockey country. Uh, let's start. Uh, we'll get into uh, Roberto Luongo and that conversation because uh, I've got a sneak peek of it, and, uh, and it's really interesting uh, about his observations on what helped him transition from uh, when he broke into the game and to what uh, is dominating his style now. And it's it's not exactly something that, that was first and foremost in my mind as far as uh, what he would point to. So a bit of a surprise there. But uh, goalie Bob and Sergei Bobrovsky in the Columbus Blue Jackets, so your observations and what you know about what happened, uh, Kevin, with uh, the controversy between the goaltender and the coach. Yeah, I think that this is, this is not so much as the team has said about the coach specifically in terms of this incident. Um, you know, I don't think anybody has the exact specifics, uh, but it sounds relatively innocuous compared to the attention that it's gotten. This is maybe something as simple as not just leaving and not coming back to the bench, but actually getting changed and preparing to, you know, leave the rink, uh, showering, that type of thing uh, before the game was over, which which isn't great, but I would argue... Um, probably is something you could have handled without turning it into this big public show that they have there. And I think when you see that, um, as much as they've insisted this is, you know, it's about him and his teammates and not him and his coach specifically, um, this is just a sign of an untenable situation that, quite frankly, they should have known about and been able to, to deal with long before this. Um, I, I don't think it's been a secret that Bob isn't coming back to to Columbus. That was the impression I had as early as March. And uh, I believe he told the organization this long before the you know Panarin news broke and became public. Um, they knew what they were dealing with in terms of Bob's contract expiring uh, this upcoming summer and have had plenty of time to sort of deal with it. When you see the way this was handled and the way it was made public, to me it's just... Um, it's a situation where it's probably more about, uh, but, but does that not make it easier? Yeah. Does it not make it easier to use them as an example? Because you, by all sense and purposes, it doesn't look like he's coming back. So you can hold them up as an example to the other guys that we're going to hold people accountable. Yeah. and, And absolutely. And I, and I think from a PR standpoint, I mean, it makes it easier to move on from when it, when it inevitably happens. Um, But I think if you're in that room and you know the work ethic that Bob has, this is a guy who leads by example. If if your goalie is your hardest working player in the weight room, um, off the ice, and leads by example, I'm not sure that's the guy you want to choose to make an example of in this situation. And what does it say to 
free agents in the future that might want to come to Columbus if they see one of the stars getting thrown under the bus. And for something I would argue that, I mean, again, I'm not excusing it in any means. Bob took the high road. Yeah, you, you it, can't you can't get changed and and leave your teammate, your your other goaltender out there because that's not an emergency goaltending situation. He, he, he either goes back in, replaces if something tragic happens or or terrible happens to uh, to your partner, then then you're really at a situation where you're putting the team in a terrible position. Yeah, no, no question. Um, like I said, not excusing the behavior, but I think, uh, well, I can think of a lot of examples of things that go on behind the scenes that I'm aware of mm. that I would argue a lot worse that never get made public the way this was made public. And to me, that's, that's a sign of the situation as much as it's not about him and torts. That's part of the background that leads to this. And that's part of the background that has Bob leaving at the end of the year. And if anybody's surprised by that, they shouldn't be. And that includes, first and foremost, the Columbus Blue Jackets, who, as I said, uh, is my understanding they were aware of this with lots of time to create a solution beyond what's happening right now before we get to what's happening right now. Dave, they need each other, though. Like, Bobrovsky needs a great playoff to elevate his market value uh, because a great playoff makes him more money and Columbus obviously needs, needs the goaltender to be on top of his game. So it's going yeah. to be an interesting marriage. I, you know. I, I, I get that, but Bob's Bob's also a guy who consistently over the past few years, I know he's not having a great year, but one of the most consistent, maybe behind a Henrik Lundqvist in terms of outperforming his environment and the shot quality that he faces in Columbus. This guy's got two Vesna trophies. Uh, I don't think his market value is going to be a big issue. And I would argue that as much as it, you know, people have made it about money and there was probably a price level price tag attached to staying in Columbus. Uh, do not underestimate how much this guy burns to win. And I could see him taking a situation where he has that opportunity ahead of a larger payday when he does hit unrestricted free agency on July 1st. To the other end of the spectrum, although when it comes to age, they're, they're closer than, than you might think. The Jordan Bennington surge onto the scene in St. Louis is becoming a bit more of a story with every game. It's now three wins in three starts and three starts in the last four games overall. Jordan Bennington, Hutch, what do you make of what's happening with the St. Louis Blues crease? Oh, I think it's a fantastic story. I've been lucky enough to be on the ice with Jordan for a day each of the last couple of summers where uh, when he trains in Toronto at the BioSteel camp and uh, just Really happy for him to see this happening. I mean, he's a 2011 draft pick and 25 years old, finally getting his uh, his first shot and making the most of it. And he's worked really hard to uh, to build his game over the last few years, and it's uh, it's starting to to pay dividends. And it's funny we were talking about this a couple of days ago, saying is is, is there a a crisis happening in the St. Louis crease? And I I didn't think there was, but but now he's had back to back starts, and what a great opportunity for him and the franchise right now. Do you ride him now? Would you? Because Craig Berube was very conscious of not putting anything into Jordan's first start, certainly his second, almost downplayed it more from, from the first to the second. So, Woodley, what do you do now? I think if you're the St. Louis Blues, you probably go hot hand on this one. As much as I hate hot hand, as much as I hate ever getting in. Well, I don't mind hot hand. What I hate is when you get into two guys and it's win and you're in to me that's one of the uh, it's one of my biggest pet peeves is win and you're in but when a guy's winning the way he is I think you you give him the run until you see signs of that fading you know sometimes it can be a blip sometimes it could be strictly the goalie's performance sometimes it could be the team just you know feeling and fueling that confidence in front of him and playing a little better in front of one guy than the other guy as long as we don't get to the win and you're in I'm okay because to me the win and you're in just adds a layer of pressure that uh, doesn't need to exist for goaltenders it should be performance based not results based and they get a bit of a bit of a stretch coming up for him too here I mean there's a game tomorrow against Washington that'll be a lot tougher uh, but then then they're off until Thursday so there's a, a chance for him to get a bit of a break and do some work as well you know, it, it's amazing. Jeff Glass, a year ago, finally got into the National Hockey League, and that was an incredible story, a world junior uh, goaltender. Jordan's uh, of the, the the same pedigree, but he's been in the same organization the entire time and finally got this look. So uh, he, he paid his dues. The St. Louis Blues certainly took their time with it, to the point where 
I guess when you look back to his 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 time with the St. Louis Blues and the way it started, the draft in 2011, that's when Winnipeg announced uh, Kevin Sheveldayoff in front of the crowd in, in St. Paul that they were going to be named the Jets. That's why I remember this. But uh, I walked out of the rink that day after the draft with Jordan, and he was uh, he was excited to be a Blue, but he was also one of those players that after he went through the car wash, his name was called, he met the organization on the floor and did all the interviews. He went up to the suite where all teams have their suite, and you're, all the players that are drafted are invited up there. He went up there, and... There was nobody left because it was it was just at the end of the draft and everybody cleared out and was catching the flights and and he said it was it was this cool moment where you're drafted and you're you're with your parents and you're you're having this great uh, reflection of of your career and you finally hit this milestone and then you walk into the suite and there's nobody so uh, just late one of those to the party that, again that stuck with me yeah late to the party again and it kind of set the tone for for what was going to happen for Jordan uh, with the, and taking his time and and having to battle through the organization uh, with the St Louis blues you guys hold on here uh want to just uh just pause here but and let everybody know that we're going to have some conversation about russian goaltending and michael hutchinson with the toronto maple Leafs, but still wearing the colors of the florida panthers that conversation to come but first a couple of interviews one roberto luongo jumps in a vehicle with our own kevin woodley and up next we go inside the gear with ccm Taking the show in a new direction now. First time into the gear side of things on In Goal Radio. Sonny DiBiase is the senior manager, key accounts at CCM Hockey. But her history and uh, experience along the goaltending side of things runs uh, deeper than just the key accounts title on the corporate uh, business card. Uh, Sonia, welcome in with David, Kevin, and Darren. Pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a pleasure. Well, you know what? I've followed your career and uh, and various presentations and, and the evolution of goaltending, and I've been fascinated uh, by your story in particular. I want to know, uh, before you give me the uh, the CV part of your, your background, are, are you a goalie? <laughs> no, I'm not. No. See, that, that part is incredible to me, and I love it. So uh, Because there's so many times you hear, you've never played the game, you can't have an opinion, but... but you, you, you're not a goalie, but I, I watch and I listen and I read your your stories and I'm and I'm and I'm really impressed. So I want the background, how you got into it, the CV, and then Kevin and David are going to take it into current mainstream goaltending and and what CCM is is doing right now. So uh, give me the the background. So I started in January 1992, recently graduating uh, from school. And there was an opportunity with Brian Heaton in the little town of Harrow, Ontario. Uh, Brian had recently uh, purchased a CAD CAM cutting machine and uh, had no knowledge or technical training. And I was brought on board uh, specifically to introduce the AutoCAD um, technology into his factory. But having a design background and a business background, uh, it wasn't long before I was, of course, uh, diving into the production floor in the design room, uh, looking at materials, trying to understand the product. Because I find not only, uh, first of all, I'm a huge hockey fan, love the sport, I love the game, um, and I really found the products interesting and, and even working along side Brian Heaton with his history from Cooper um, and how product had evolved even at that point uh, so many years ago. But it wasn't long before I was designing uh, products alongside Brian. Then you moved on to CCM. Was it right then? So what happened was in 1994, Heaton was acquired by a company called Caru. Caru yes. owned the brands Coho, Titan, Canadian, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with many of them, of obviously with Gretzky Sticks and uh, Coho <laughs> being a popular brand from Lemieux. Um, but on the goalie side, you know, you, when you think of Coho, I always think of obviously Patrick Waugh, Felix Potvin. I mean, there's so many that we could list um, back in the day. What is your current role and and how do you fit into the whole CCM? I know it's CCM hockey, but the, the CCM goaltending brand. So, so what has happened is I was uh, able, very fortunate, to grow within the organization. So Heaton was 
uh, purchased by Caru, and then Caru was purchased by CCM. And through all these acquisitions, I was able to move from design and development to product management. And then the last almost eight years, I've been the business unit leader for the goalie category, working with uh, an amazing team. But honestly, you know, running a goalie category for a brand like CCM, um, it really is team not only internally within the CCM uh, design and development, but our partners like In Goal Magazine, uh, Eli Wilson Goaltending. All of the goalies that I've worked with over the last 27 years are are what have made actually CCM successful. It's all that contribution. And I honestly believe not being a goalie myself helped in the sense that I wasn't um, tunnel visioned into thinking goalie equipment needed to be one way or another. I was always open-minded listening to, to coaches like Francois Lair and his coaching style and, and how he actually created some of the trend in the goalie equipment that we did back in those days based on the butterfly style and Patrick Waugh. And what's fascinating is if you go over these lines, I, heard, I, I find it shocking to say I'm saying 27 years, but it's changed so much. And and butterfly isn't a style anymore. It's, it's a safe technique. And, and there's so much that's been developed in the goaltending position uh, with coaching from all different aspects that you see so many different save techniques today. And, and I think the goaltending position has become so unique that even at the NHL level, you see so many different styles. Just going to hop in there. Sorry, Darren. I was going to say, Sonia, 27 years, starting with Brian Heat, and you transition over to CCM, working with the Lafay, Le- first Michelle, now his son, Pat. Like, you have essentially overseen the evolution of the equipment industry for goaltending worldwide. When you look back at those trends and that, like I said, like there's been a lot of different changes over the years. Like what are some of the ones that jump at it? Like some of the aha moments from the gear development side where maybe even it was something that you weren't sure was going to work, but this ended up becoming something that we now consider a staple uh, as goaltenders. We couldn't live without. That's an amazing question, Kevin, because, you know, I have thought about that um, recently with some of the projects we're working on today because the aha moment was blockade. The CCM blockade pad, although it was not a success at retail, was ahead of its time because that was the introduction of a flat pad on the front, flat face. But what was more interesting about the technology in that product was when I started in 92, we were putting deer hair in gold pads. <laughs> and that's insane when you think about it today. And the weight, I mean, each leg was seven, eight pounds. Um, and, and we used uh, fiber that you put in pillows and you just stuffed and stuffed and stuffed these products. And, and I remember saying to Brian one day, when I was actually stuffing a gold pad with deer hair, I said, we have to find something else because I was allergic and getting a rash on my arms. Um, I said, I can't build this product even to make a prototype because I was getting all rashy from the deer hair. But, uh, but what happened is the pinnacle. Well, I, I was just going to say, Sonia, like the, the name Brian Heaton is, is legendary for those of us who've been in the industry for a long time, but we've got a, a large group of readers probably that aren't going to be uh, quite as familiar. So can you, just give us a little backstory on Brian before we, we carry on. So Brian, um, you know, was a designer himself and, and he actually started with a, a opening a hockey, well, actually he started with Cooper uh, right out of college. He was working for Cooper. And what was interesting back then was he actually developed the Cooper all pant. So a lot of people associate Brian Heaton with goaltending, but he developed the Cooper all pant. Um, then he moved back home, started a, a hockey store, Brian's. Um, Custom Pro, which was just a retail location, and it all started with repalming gloves. I mean, that's where it always starts in some of these retail stores. And then he he started looking at goalie equipment and fixing, repairing catch gloves, blockers, repalming blockers as well. And it all started there. It was uh, it was amazing to see how he transferred what was his retail operation uh, and sold that retail store to then open up his. Um, Brian's Custom Pro uh, business. And then through his partnership with that, sold Brian's Custom Pro and opened up Heat and Custom Goalie Equipment. I want to I get back to the deer hair. 
So, because, and, and Hutch was right. Not everyone, as much as our, for us, we know yes. who Brian Heaton was. Um, it's great to, to, to sort of let our younger listeners know that these are, these are the people that got us to where we are. You, Sonia, have overseen a lot of that, like getting us to where we are as goalies today. But I want to know how you got away from the deer hair. And does your allergy in any way translate to the fact we finally did? <laughs> well, it was interesting. What, what Brian and I did was we went to um, the actual auto show in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we, were, we were at the auto show, and there was actually a, tied to that auto show a materials show. And there were a lot of materials for the car seats um, and the foams. And we started looking at foams and different materials used in automobiles. And I said to Brian, I looked at a seat. And again, I'm not a goalie. And actually, Brian Heaton wasn't a goalie either. Most people don't know that, but Brian Heaton was not a goalie. So (laughs) we looked at it and said, why couldn't we take a piece of foam? and re- eliminate all that stuffing and just use a foam from top to bottom. Um, because the, the, the reason a goal pad, if you look at even an E-Flex goal pad today, the reason it had an outer roll was because you had to stuff it so that it maintained its length. You, if you think about a pillow, if you were to stuff a pillow, which is like a tube, it would just become round. So you have to create these vertical, narrow rolls. So the one on the outer roll was created for length. The knee rolls were created to create the horizontal width so that the pad didn't just become a tube from stuffing. See, now you have to be careful here, Sonia, because (laughs) I know that story about the outer roll. I know that the outer roll was there to basically give the pad its shape, but now that we don't need the outer roll... We don't, we don't want Kay Whitmore and anyone from the NHL hearing this because the outer roll may soon become extinct. And as a goalie myself, I like it. I like having that little extra inch sticking out just in case that puck chipped in front of me gets knocked down. So uh, True. we can't give away too many secrets on this podcast. Um, so that transition to, a, to, to foam, like that yes. might be one of the biggest transitions we've seen in, in goaltending equipment. I would argue, you know, from the outside – that and the addition of a knee landing area for butterfly. Oh, a hundred percent. And and what we realized um, over time was that there wasn't a, a one size fits all for everyone when it came to the back of a goal pad. You know, when when you go back to he light one, he light two, there was one style of leg channel. Um, and then what we realized is that as butterfly style evolved and Francois Allaire with his, you know, the bottom 12 inches of the net allowed for 80% of the goals, it was, that was how that position became. It was based on statistics. And therefore, we had to find ways to improve the protection for that knee area, especially, our bodies are not meant to drop on the knees 40 to 50 times in a three hour period or two hour period. I mean, that's just not normal. And what we tell my hips that Sonia. (laughs) Well, what's fascinating is I can go now to about seven years ago when I started doing research uh, with Dr. Ryan Frain at the university of Western. And, and cause what I was learning with the, these, First of all, Giguere with the hip operations and then kids proactively getting hip operations. And what we realized is this technique that Francois Allaire created not just impacted knees, but it also directly impacted hips. Um, that energy transfer does go from the knee directly to the hip. And that's all been uh, qualified and quantified through this research. So there, there's so much that is, I could talk for days about the evolution. And we could listen for days. <laughs> it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like we're going to have to have part two, three, and four for this one, Sonia. Uh, listen, like working hand in hand with, with some of these big names over the years, like what are the, yes. some of the ones that jump out beyond a layer? Like I know, like I'm not sure that your average goaltender realizes just how big an impact, just how directly that relationship worked with one of, you know, a guy who I would argue should be the first goaltending coach in the Hall of Fame. I have argued it, and I'm starting to make this argument with the people that do the voting. Um, it wasn't just that he created a style. Like, working hand-in-hand hand with him, uh, w- with the Lefebvre's, is there anyone else that jumps out? Goalies, you know, Jonathan Bernier, a guy used to show up at the Lefebvre factory in the summers just to sort of hang out and see it all. 
the back and forth between some of the people that play the position and have changed the position and how that's influenced the way you build equipment for it. A hundred percent, Kevin. I mean, like, you know, when you go back over the years, every NHL goalie that I've worked with from Curtis Joseph and Tim Shovelday to Patrick Waugh, Felix Poffin, and even the goalies today, Crawford, Carey Price, they directly impact design. They come to us with a problem or a question. Um, and some of, sometimes, whether it's the coach being Francois Lair saying, when the goalie is going down, there's a hole here, or this is happening. This is where we as designers uh, have to go back. And, and so many times I know Patrick, Michelle, and I have gone back and said, what do we do to fix this problem? And how do we? And, and that's where, you know, it really gets fun and interesting and where the creativity begins. Because it's what I want people to really understand is that we don't just sit in a room and, and, and really, you know, try and create these wild ideas. It's really how do we make the product better, more protective, stop more goals, uh, reduce injury, uh, but more importantly, make the position fun as well. We want goaltenders to not even think about their equipment. We want them to think about the positioning, you know, how they're supposed to play, the save techniques, the they shouldn't even have to think about the product that they're wearing. It should be a part of their body. You talked about that work with Ryan Frayne. And obviously, see, we've been blessed. Me and, me and Hutch have had the opportunity to sort of come and see the facilities, tour the facilities a couple times with the Lefebvre's, see your research facilities, talk to Ryan Frayne and see the work that kind of goes into this. I think, you know, sometimes when it's a big company like, like CCM and in the past tied to Adidas, people are just like, oh, it's just a big company. They just make goalie equipment. We've been blessed to sort of see the firsthand, uh, the level of research you do. But I want to talk a little bit about that work with Ryan Frain. Was there anything that surprised you that changed the way you build pads based on his research at, at Western in terms of how a pad gets to the ice? Because I got to be honest with you, the first time he told me that the pad gets to the ice before the knee gets to the ice, I was I was kind of blown away and kind of confused. And then when he proved it to me, it's like, wow, okay, this could change how you build things. Exactly. Well, so interestingly enough, you mentioned that point, Kevin, because that was my first lunch with, with Ryan uh, t discussing our partnership. That was my hypothesis that I wanted to prove. I was looking at Giguerre. I was looking at Patrick Waugh back in the day, how loose they kept the top straps. Bootstraps, super tight. It was loose from the top and then you know, got tighter as you went down into the calf. I said, with that knee strap so loose, that pad, when they're in their positioning, the pad is closing the five hole just from the strap being loose. And I said, I believe if the strap is loose, when the knee pushes on the knee raiser, the momentum drops that pad to the ice quicker than the body can actually get there. It was a, it was from me just watching footage and Ryan said I was crazy, but of course, three years later, he, he gave me the, uh, the, the, the evidence and the proof that my hypothesis was correct. And he didn't even believe it himself. Uh, but you know, that's why that research was so important because there were so many ideas and concepts we had, but we needed to validate it. Yeah, and I, I would have told you you were crazy too until I saw the research, and then it all yeah. makes sense. And then all of a sudden, hey, what's next? You design yeah. a pad that allows that allows yeah. you to make that step that gets it to the ice sooner. Exactly. And when you go back to your other question about what was the most surprising, Ryan quantified that when an, a goalie is landing on that knee guard, it's three times the force of their body weight, three times. So think about that. Not every goaltender is 100 pounds. <laughs> you may have a few intermediates, those tall, lanky kids. But uh, think about your average NHL goalie and their weight. And these are athletes. And so when you drop on your knees, that's th the force is three times your body weight. And that's why not just the knee landing pad and stack that needs to be protective. But what we've truly been trying to educate goalies lately is the need for knee protectors as a separate accessory piece to the point where we've removed it. We removed what we had as a thigh guard that was sold with a goal pad because we don't want goalies to think that's all I need. 
We removed it and we said, make sure you buy an independent knee guard accessory. Um, and of course, there's so many different models and styles. Some like bulky, some like them a little bit more fitted. Uh, there's great product on the marketplace, but more importantly, you know, knee protection. I mean, this is where uh, three times your body weight, that force multiple yeah. times. It's insane. Well, for a lot of us, that means it's 600 pounds of pressure every time we drop to the <laughs> butterfly. And I can tell you at 45, I feel that every time. Exactly. <laughs> so is that the next wave of design? I mean, e everything to date has been, uh, how can we stop more pucks? And now we're talking about protecting goaltenders. So many more uh, goaltenders, young and old, going in for hip surgery. Um, are you taking that research into the design of the product more now? A hundred percent. I mean, that's really what we're looking at today is injury is, is, you know, the most important thing we, of course we want to stop more pucks. And, and even though there's, there's people that want to reduce equipment and, and, and they want to see more goals. And I get that. I, 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 I love the sport as well. I love to see goals. Um, but of course, most important, we need to make sure our goalies are protected. Um, and, but more importantly, I have to have confidence in that net. And if they feel a stinger or, or have any um, doubt of injury or, or, or concern, you know, we don't want that to happen. So they have to be fully confident um, that they're going to be protected. So everything from the research that we're learning today. But what's interesting, David and, and Kevin, um, is that, like I said, when we started the research, it was to understand injuries to knee and hips. But that was when we learned that the pad actually hit the ice before the knee did. So we actually learned how we can make product better to stop more pucks in the research of understanding injuries. Oh, fascinating. Can we can we just take it back a second, Sonia? And you yes. mentioned so, some of the uh, the older goaltenders that you worked with. Uh, old is not the term, but uh, goaltenders from days gone by. Uh, who were some of the fascinating people that you met? I mean. Not not just the names, but but some of the characters. Uh, Eddie Belfour, fascinating oh. character. <laughs> because Eddie, I believe, um, had his pads next to his bed, you know, and he he lived and breathed his equipment. Uh, he knew foams. He knew quarter inch, half inch, HD, LD, uh, and he was very specific. And and he was playing before the rules today. So there was a lot of goalies just coming in, say, "Can you do this and that to my goal pad?" Um, so he was unique in just how educated he was on the product and the materials. Uh, because most goalies today, if you ask a goalie today about their specs, they don't even know. I wear a CCM pack, <laughs> you know, uh, I wear an E-Flex or a Premier. They don't know if they have a loose fit, a tight fit, a super tight leg channel. Um, they might tell you, yeah, I've got a bootstrap and uh, one calf, but that's just because they know how many straps they're doing up. They don't know their stiffness profile. Do they have an internal double, an internal single? Uh, they don't know. The, most goalies today are not as in tune with what their gear is as the goalies from days gone by. I mean, those goalies back in the day really really were looking for competitive advantages and knew about the product. And it was very common for them, just like today, to come to the factory off season in the summer and uh, tinker with their gear, as we used to say. <laughs> it's that see, you know, and I hear that all the time, Sonia. It's actually getting harder to have gear conversations with some of these young guys because you're exactly right. They are not yeah. as in tune with their equipment. Sometimes I would argue too much out of tune. Like they're, they're not where they need to be. As yeah. a pro, I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be Ichiro with the Mariners having, you know, a, a humidor for his bats, but you need to understand how your equipment performs. And there are times I run into guys that I honestly don't think do. Now, going back to the older guys, strangest yeah. request that actually ended up working out and being something that you maybe move forward with. Was there one that jumps out? Well, Garth knows uh, shoulder wings. <laughs> <laughs> Was that you? <laughs> well, that was Brian Heaton. Yeah, I was there with yeah. Brian when they, we did that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even the, the puck foil, there were so many things we created that were, were great. They were great design ideas, but uh, What's the they puck stopped foil? Pucks. So that was a plastic piece below your toe bind. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah it, but it Darren's was out of the union now. <laughs> yeah. I now I remember. Now, yeah. Hey. Yeah. It was, it was illegal very quickly. Um, <laughs> Patrick Waugh always wanted uh, three by three 
uh, two and a half inch thick square blocks on the side of his pants. Um, <laughs> yeah, they wow. were square, three inch by three inch, and it was about two and a half inches wide, just cubes on the side waist of his pants. Um, there, there were some interesting, uh, you know, every goaltender had something unique about them. I can honestly say, um, and, and, you know, that's why if you look at equipment today, we've got still a 580, a 590 and a 600 break. Cause depending on how they want that glove to close, um, you know, there's just, they're, they're all unique in, in what they're looking for. And I remember, uh, Brader, he was okay with bruises on his ribs. He didn't want a chest protector that provided, like he would have no problem playing to the NHL <laughs> with reducing uh, the size and so forth because he played with almost his junior style chest protector. And he said, I'm okay taking a bruise because I need to be able to move. You know, and, that, and yeah. you look at how he played. <laughs> okay, and so switching that from those guys that were uh, almost driving innovation through some personal preferences mm -hmm. to today's goaltender, yeah. We're going to have Roberto Luongo on a little later. I know you've had a chance to work with him. The one thing to me about Roberto is his passion for the game, and that comes right down to his gear. So we have seen him add elements of his equipment. Like you said, a lot of goalies, they just give me the same as I had last year. Give me the same. as They don't want to make those changes. Mm -hmm. But we've seen Roberto change his equipment based on trying things at some of the summits with you in Montreal that were at retail first. So is there almost, can there be almost more satisfaction there when you make a change based on your research and you take it to retail and then you have an NHL guy say, wow, this is great. I want that on my pets. Yeah. Uh, you know what, Kevin, you've hit on a key point that I've really noticed change over the years. Uh, goalies from the past, and, and I don't put Luongo in that because he's, he's more open today, but uh, Belfort and those guys were don't change. Give me what I had last time. Sometimes, you know, it was just give me what I had last time. Uh, whereas, you know, young goalies today, it's all about technology. What's new, what's new. And that's generation, generation X and Y, right? That's how they've been raised. They want the newest, latest and greatest. Um, so what happened is for example, Luongo has always used, uh, the regular synthetic leather, the Clarino, and once he came to our summit and saw Speedskin, which we launched at retail, he said, what's this? <laughs> and he could hear the z -z 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 for the kids that were playing on the X with the pads. And his next set had Speedskin. <laughs> and it's just because, again, you know, again, these guys, it's so intense during the season. You only have a few months with them off season to really talk gear. Um, and if, like I think about Corey Crawford, the year he wins a cup, you don't even see him all summer. He's so tied up with uh, events and, and uh, things that he has to attend. So, you know, we, we really do cherish the time we have with these elite, elite athletes and, and how they're able to share. Um, but Luongo, you know, what, what I love about him, first, he's so great. He communicates uh, what he likes, what he doesn't like, which is key. But this guy, you know, with after his injury, went out to a retail store in Florida and bought a composite CCM stick and started no playing kidding. with it just because it was lighter. So that's how he switched. You know, he just, uh, it's, it's a crazy story, but these are the things that happen because, you know, they, they, they see product that sometimes we bring to retail and maybe they weren't open, but once they see it actually launched, Hey, I'll try that. <laughs> I'm going to let, uh, Kevin Woodley go because he's got to go grab Roberto Luongo, jump in the car yes. and do an interview. So say goodbye yes. to Kevin and we're going to let him go. Then I'm going to do a little wrap up with you, Sonia. Sounds great. <laughs> say hi, Kevin, say, say hello to. Okay. I will definitely say I will definitely say hi to Roberta for you. And I'm mean, now that I've gotten stories about him from you, we're going to have to ask for the reverse. <laughs> so you've been warned. Okay. <laughs> oh, right on. See you, Kev. Okay, so I'm just going to jump in here, uh, Darren Millard, now with uh, David Hutchinson and uh, and Sonia. Uh, I'm going to ask some goofy questions that are just people may not understand. What's a CAD CAM cutting machine? You mentioned oh. that at the very start. Yeah, computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing. Okay, so that was uh, he just bought one of those. That was Brian Heaton uh, yes. that did that. Uh, who are the guinea pigs when you guys have when you guys have new product and you're testing it who who does that who are your guinea pigs um so it's always local kids 
um, like, first of all, employees of our company, number one. Uh, we have a testing league internally today that we use through the schools like McGill and Concordia. Uh, we have goalie advisors. And like, when I say goalie advisors, it includes coaches. It includes Kevin and Dave, who are so in tune with the goalie market. They're talking to kids. They're talking to pros. These guys are our goalie advisement staff. Um, and although, you know, like are we, we really cherish these partnerships because um, the feedback that they provide us uh, is, is key to as product evolves and, and even sometimes how we go to launch with product and launch timing as well. So it's coaches, it's employees. And, and when I say employees, I include those partnerships, which is goalie coaches, Dave and Kevin. Uh, they're not paid. Unfortunately, they're the cheapest <laughs> okay. CCM employees we have. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, that's the other thing, too. Like, uh, I, I feel bad sometimes that we, we don't compensate uh these partnerships, but we do value them um, and we hope to support them any way we can. So if, you know, if they need to run a contest or something, we always try and help them with, with product so that it's a little bit reciprocal. But I will honestly say they give us way more than we give them as far as the feedback and the, uh, the opinions that we really respect from them. We're going to do a part two here with you, Sonia, but, mm -hmm. uh, but just a couple more things. Uh, how do you guard protecting your your technology and and what you've got in the cutting edge with with mm -hmm. testing it out and it not getting out? I'm I'm just curious about that side of things because somebody sees something, and it doesn't take very long in today's uh, society for a picture, a, a, a quick snap to to get on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, and then and then the cat's out of the bag. Yeah, yeah. IP is is key uh, in the CCM organization, and we start with registering a patent before we even. Uh, allow a sample to leave the building. Okay. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, do you have a glove, a blocker, and a pad specialist in each of those? I'm just going to limit it to those those three pieces of equipment, or are do you guys look after all three equally? All three equally. Okay. 80% uh, of the goals are on the bottom. You mentioned that at the start uh, when you when you sort of got into with the Francois Lair. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know what what it is now that, that we've gone through the whole butterfly transition to now where it's not a style, it's just a, a blocking technique or a stopping save technique? Yeah, I don't have the statistics today, but I know obviously that it isn't the same because of that technique. So guys were shooting top corner. I mean, that's where top corner yeah. became so important. And, you know, blocker side, you, you, I do see a lot of blocker side goals. Um, but you know what? It really depends on the goalie. Every goalie Pat has a strength and a weakness. Patrick Watt, uh, that loose yes. top strap, that was that was intriguing. So, yeah. so he started that, and then you you kind of were watching this and and trying to uh, figure out uh, whether that pad got to the bottom, and and you you confirmed that. Did did Patrick wear his pad knowing that that pad was getting to the ice sooner, or I'm just curious, what where was Patrick's mind in that whole process? Oh yeah, for sure he knew. For sure he knew because um, the, the thing is, I noticed watching him skate out on the ice before the game even starts. He skates out on the ice, does a couple laps around the rink. Uh, you, his pad almost would go rotate around his whole leg if yeah. it wasn't secured at the boot. I mean, you could see I, 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 he's the one goalie that I have to say probably wore the straps the loose, loosest. <laughs> um most loose and and that pad just it always looked flimsy but he he that's where his skill came in because even though that pad had a lot of rotation and movement he was able to control it and that's where the skill really t comes into play how many years out are you working on a product line three okay so we're looking at 2022 you're working on 2022 stuff right now yeah i mean we're deep into 2021 yeah. Um, but we're already talking about 2022. Wow, that's see, I, I just think graphic designs and things like that. Uh, how far ahead you you must be. So never mind technology and uh, and so forth. Will you be okay to come back for part two at some point uh, down the road? Because uh, I'm just I'm just getting into this. These guys have known you forever, and and they've got a ton of questions. Imagine me. Uh, so sure. I, I'd love to have you back for part two. Love to love to uh, join you. That's great. Uh, Dave, this is uh, this has been fun. Thanks for bringing me into this part. It's it's been great. I wonder if we just want to give Sonia a second to tell us about her new role and what she's uh, up to now. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what I felt is uh, 
it was actually a little bittersweet. I, I love goaltending. Um, I've loved running the category and, and working with so many great people, but I needed a new challenge. Um, and I felt I had a team that I could pass the torch to. I really feel confident in the team in CCM that we can pass the torch and, and, and they're going to be amazing and, and launch amazing products. So I was uh, afforded an opportunity to work into a, a sales role, um, business development with some key accounts. And I was interested because now I get to touch player player skates, sticks, helmets, you know, the whole uh, gamut. So it's uh, it's a great opportunity for me because I still get to be a part of CCM. I still get to be a part of this amazing industry, this the best sport in the world, hockey, <laughs> and, uh, and yet still uh, kind of expand my uh, professional experience. So key accounts, who do you work with? Monkey Sports and Dick Sporting Goods in the U.S. Well, so just a couple of small accounts, eh? They're just, they're just <laughs> easing you in? Easing me in, yes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, what What have you learned the most about the player side, and then and then we'll we'll wrap this up because uh, that that's got to be a, a stiff learning curve. Um, what I'm learning is that uh, players are not as techy as goalies are. That I see. <laughs> I mean, there are some, but I could tell you every goalie I've ever met. They're techie. <laughs> and sometimes I've always said, you better know your stuff if you're going to sell goalie equipment because you'll be challenged. Sometimes consumers know more than uh, kids that work in the store. Uh, whereas as player, it's not as um, as techie, but I think that's changing because as you see technology in, in skates and sticks with composites and so forth, I think that's changing. And I also think it's a generation thing. This new generation I mean, we see it with Apple. <laughs> we see it with uh, all types of technologies. Kids are all about new technology, latest and greatest. So I think you're going to see that changing in player as well. So much fun. Uh, and uh, I, I'll, I'll put a bow on it this way. Allergies and an auto show responsible for modern goal equipment. Uh, who would have, uh, who would have uh, thought that coming into this conversation? But uh, uh, Sonia, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And we look forward to uh, chatting with again uh, on the uh, In Goal Radio podcast. Thank you so much for having me. One of the things that we're going to do on In Goal Radio, the podcast, is introduce you and let you have a a real experience with the goaltenders in the National Hockey League. And there's no better real poster boy for In Goal Magazine and the transition and development of goaltending than Roberto Luongo. He spent eight years in Vancouver. This is 11th season with the Florida Panthers. He's over 1,000 games. He's a world junior goaltender, an Olympic champion, and has also played in the world championship. You can argue that there's nothing Roberto Luongo hasn't done in the world of hockey. Until now, in his return to Vancouver with the Florida Panthers, our own Kevin Woodley caught up with him and probably produced one of the most memorable interviews that Roberto Luongo has ever experienced. Here's Kevin Woodley with Lou. So we're just chilling with Roberto Luongo today, and we're actually going to be driving here. So I don't know if it's riding in cars with Roberto Luongo. Does that mean at some point? Like, what are your singing skills? I don't pretend to be James Corden here, but how are the singing skills? Uh, not very good. I'd rather be the Jerry Seinfeld version where we get a coffee in a car. <laughs> Ooh. I, unfortunately, my car isn't up to Seinfeld standards. And as we've already established today, the nav is definitely not up to Seinfeld standards. We've done a few extra laps. So let's just, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, we're going to start driving here. And I'm going to start with one question that I know you're getting a ton of right now. And the question is sort of, are you getting sick of answering questions about how long you're going to play at this point? Uh, I mean, I'm not getting sick of it. I understandable that people are curious, uh, but to be honest with you, I don't. I don't know myself. I don't have an answer. I mean, I'd like to play for as long as possible. And I still love playing the game. So uh, you know, right now I've been going through a little bit of a tough time. So it's uh, it's been a little bit tougher. But uh, you know, once once I get out of it, uh, I'll be back to where I need to be and, and having fun. I think the fact that. After all these years, on your way to the Hall of Fame, you the fact you can still have a tough time, what, I think young goalies want to know, how do you get out of it? 
like even after all these, like how do you, how do you find that way out when things aren't going the way you would like them to go as a goaltender? I think it has it changed over the years. Is it can it apply to a 12 year old the same way it applies to a 20 year veteran? Well, I think everybody's different, but for me, it's always it's always been uh, the two things that always bring me back and get me back to where where I need to be. And number one is just double down in practice and, and work as hard as you can and, and fight for every shot and and make sure that you're you're, you're playing every shot like it's a game. Uh, and, and the other thing that's probably even more important, uh, mental side, you just have to let everything go and just say screw it I'm just gonna go out there and play and have fun and whatever happens happens and sometimes it sounds a little bit weird to say like you don't care but for a goalie it's got to be like that a little bit just so that you can have a short memory and forget about what's happened and just enjoy the moment and, and, and what you're doing and, and, and that's usually how you start to thir- turn things around I think it's kind of funny for me to hear the questions about how long you'll play because I've gotten to see the passion you have for the game, um, the work you put in to continue playing since the hip surgery. Um, a lot of people might have retired after that, but just how hard you work to keep playing kind of makes it feel like the questions about whether you want to are silly. But do you like? Is that what? What is it? What is it about the game that drives you to keep going right now? What? What? What do you love about it? Well, there's, a, there's a lot of things. You know, first of all, it's it's been my life for half more than half of my half of my whole entire life. You know, I've been something I've been doing I've been in NHL for half of my life. So uh, I don't That's know. That's kind of crazy I, to I think know, about. I don't know anything else. You know, and uh, uh, I just love being around the guys. I love to compete. You know, I love to to play and and, and, and the, the reaction of the crowd after a big save. Um, you know, those are the things that you know. About would I be okay not having those things anymore if I decided that it would be time to, to stop? I'm not just quite there yet. I just want to keep going. I don't, I don't know how many more, how long, you know, how long. But uh, as long as I have that fire that I want to keep playing and, and, and be the best that I can be, I mean, I, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to keep playing. What? Where did that start? Like, do you remember the first time you felt that? Maybe not the big crowd. Because I'm guessing in the parents' basement playing, you know, mini sticks. It probably wasn't mini sticks back then, but like, where did that? Do you remember the first time it was like, man, like I love this? Uh, I mean, I've always loved it. It's just as a kid, even though, like you just said, there wasn't any crowds or, or whatnot. But uh, I just pretend to to play sometimes by myself and and, and, and just take a ball and, and just pretend that I was playing in a game or playoffs or Stanley Cup final and. Just shoot it at myself and, and, and try to stop it and make cluff saves and, and, and just put myself in that moment. And uh, um, you know, since since then, it's always been there. You know, and, and I've always wanted to be part of that. And and uh, that's why I enjoy playing on the road so much because I like I love the reaction when you when you make a save that the crowd is stunned. Now you started. In, in was Emma correct? It was the basement. Is that like? Is that like when you talk? When you're throwing balls against a wall, making saves against yourself, or like, paint me that picture. Is it street hockey? Yeah. When did it become on the ice? When did that passion sort of? And it was Grant Fear too, right? That's who you were. You're just catching with the wrong hand. <laughs> well, I wasn't catching with the wrong hand, but Grant Fear was my yeah. idol, and it was everywhere. It was in my basement. It was in the street with my uh, neighborhood kids. Uh, in my driveway, I, I, I put a ball, uh, you know, in Montreal, the drives are slanted, so I'd, I'd put a ball at the top of the driveway and make it roll down on its own, and I'd be at the bottom of the driveway and, and make, try to make it hit a pothole so it would bounce and I'd have to make a save right in front of me, and, like, crazy stuff like that, and then, uh, you know, it could be, like, uh, just in my living room, and, and I, I would be on my knees, and I would, with one hand, I would, you know, throw the ball at me, and with the other hand, I'd try to catch it or make a save, and... Uh, just find different type of ways to, to, you know, to entertain yourself. And I had two younger brothers, and, and as they got a little bit older, we would all play together, which was fun. Now, from the whether it's the basement or the house or the driveway and the potholes to the top of the NHL, that transition period, like when, what, at what age did you start to think, hey, this is something I could spend half my life doing? And when did it go from something that you did? for that fun, for that pleasure, for that pure joy to something you thought about could be a career? 
I think uh, it was probably when I was 15. Uh, I played Bantam AA. Uh, uh, so then the following year, it was my second year Bantam, but I got invited to the Midget AAA camp and uh, I actually made the team as, a, as an underage. And uh, within a, a couple of months of the season started, uh, one of uh, an agent, that, which eventually became my agent, you know, went up to my parents and just told them, you know, that. Uh, of the fact that your son's going to be moving away and, and all that kind of stuff and I guess that's when it kind of became a reality that this is, is something that could possibly uh, you know happen if, if I keep working hard and, and, and things fall right. When did it trans like when did it become a job for you was it or was it from that stage on or do you do you even look at it that way I know how much prep you put into it like that's never been a job for me I mean it's always been uh, something that I love doing and I enjoyed and uh that's why I consider myself lucky. You know, it's been able to do what I love and, and my whole uh, my whole life, and, and not having to feel like it's work. And you know, when when people uh, can say that, I mean, I think they're, they're doing the right thing in the right profession. Evolution of your game. Um, we've seen it. I got to see it firsthand here in Vancouver. And Vancouver, a tough market. Maybe I'm to blame for some of it because of the spotlight I put on goaltending, but. Also a tough market where every little adjustment is microanalyzed. I don't think like said, maybe that is my fault a little bit. I'm a fault. And goalies aren't going to want to talk to me anymore. But like from club positioning to where you are in the crease, what have been some of the biggest things for you over the past, let's say five years, even ten years? Like in terms of as the games evolve, changes you've made that really have been important to where you are today and still play. That's something that uh, really um, took my game to a different level. I think before that, um, just a regular BH guy, and a lot of times I'd be flat-footed or let in goals some bad, from bad angles, and saw a lot of that when I was in my earlier years of Vancouver. And then uh, once I started making that transition, it allowed me to uh, play, you know, certain plays in a different way and see the play better and, and able to react in, in a much better way and uh, uh, it really changed uh, you know the way I played uh, but also gave me I think uh, a little bit more longevity as far as uh, being able to stay in the league and, and be uh, effective. Now you, you may or may not be on social media I don't know but RVH reverse VH fail is a popular hashtag as we watch games around the league, and people love to pick apart reverse VH. And then you hear how tra you know transformational it's been for you. Do, do you think some of the critics of it, like I mean, it's not always executed perfectly, and sometimes it gets picked apart. But do you think some of the critics of it at times maybe lose sight of where we were before it existed? Yeah, of course. I mean, and listen, not, not everything's going to be perfect, right? There's always going to be a little bit of flaws and. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, it, you know a puck will go in from a bad angle. It's just just the way it is, right? Everybody lets in goals like that, no matter what position you apply from from bad angle shots. But uh, it just brings so much more to the table as far as like reads and being able to push off your post. You know, already you know in a butterfly position, and, and it's just so mo so much more effective. Not only from you know a lot of people just look at it as bad angle shots, but it. it Bring so much more to the table than that, as far as being able to recover and and, and push and, and all that kind of stuff, and not be locked into, you know, a position like a you know like a VH for example. So it, it allows for much more uh, uh, mobility around the crease. Now, the one popular thing we hear is whenever a goal goes in, and it's usually the non goalies that offer this up, or I mean, some of the old school yeah. goalies, just stand up. Yeah. What do you what goes through your mind when you hear people say? Because I know even within reverse VH, seeing you. And being on the ice with you this summer, one of your key is, or one of the things everyone's working on right now, is to be patient and not be in it too early. Yeah. But that's a long stretch from the sort of this wide, you know, just broad brushed stay on your skates. Like that, what goes through your mind when you hear critics, not of you, but of around the league, say, oh, just stand up more, stay on your skates? Yeah, I don't really pay attention to it. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I know what works and, 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 and what doesn't, and, you know, even sometimes the older generational goalies, you know, I think for me, this is what kept me in the league so long. It's like, I, I wasn't stuck in my ways and I was I had an open mind and, and tried things to see if they would help me and if it was effective and all that kind of stuff. And, and 
and that's the key for me. So, I, you know, when, when I look at an older player, older goalies or, or whatever, like try to criticize certain moves like that they never tried or they never really used, you know, it, you can't really, you know, pay too much attention to it. You just have to have an open mind. And I think, uh, yeah, you're going to get scored on. It's, it happens. But, you know, if you let in three, but you might have, you know, saved the, the 10, you know, that you would have got scored on a different type of play if, if you weren't in that position to begin with. So... Um, that's the way I look at it. Listen, if a guy can pick the crossbar, you know, off the crossbar and in from, from the goal line, you got to give the guy credit. You know, like not everybody can do that. So uh, I'm willing to sacrifice the odd goal that way to, to make sure that, uh, you know, maybe I stop uh, five or six different, you know, ones using the, the reverse on, on different plays. Now, you talked about evolution of your game. Part of that and part of what I've always admired about you is that you're willing to try new things, and that includes equipment. Yep. But before we get into the new things you've added to your equipment over the years, I want to know what the sickest set you ever had was. Because I remember the Cohos back in Florida. Yeah. Those were some. Those are some pretty bright, nice style point sets. What like what? Even if it was as a kid, what what jump? What's your favorite set of all time? Like, do you still get geeked at all about gear? Uh, I mean, and the gear. When I was a kid, the gear was like my favorite stuff: gloves and pads and all that kind of stuff. Now that I'm older, I'm really more fixated on masks. I like I love masks, I like goalie masks, old ones, new ones. Like I have all of mine that I'll be setting up uh, in my game room, my new house. Um, I'm gonna order a bunch of like vintage goalie masks that I also want to set up in there. And it's, it's just gonna be. Uh, you know, hold this play, and, and, and I'm, I love them. And when I was a kid, I remember being fascinated by them. So, uh, uh, as far as personal, my, my favorite set, and, and it popped funny, it pops up on, on my timeline once in a while, is that uh, red, uh, red, yellow, and blue uh, coho set that I had. I think it was my, uh, might have been my second year in Florida, first or second year in Florida that uh, people seem to enjoy. A lot of color in those sets as well, and that's kind of disappeared yeah. from the game for goaltenders. Before I ask you about that, though, masks like favorite one, like who's like what's the one historically or two or three that jump out that like that's the mask you have to have you know reproduced for your collection from your memories. Well, the one uh, there's two of them, but my favorite one is obviously the, my, the Grand Fuhr one because he was my favorite goalie, and, and I already have that one. It was a uh, it was a gift from Jamie McLennan which was very nice of him. And uh, my, the other mask that I really loved when I was a kid was the, uh, I don't know if you remember this one, the Murray Bannerman one from Chicago. Yep. Uh, I just loved the loved it, and, and I was always fascinated by it, and, and I'll be ordering it uh, for the house. Yeah, your your mask style has simplified over the years, too. I remember the, 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 the Pink Panther in the early Florida days. Now just sort of like, uh, you know, Bold logos, gold. Like what? What jumps out to you are the way mask styles evolved over the past couple of years. Well, for me, I think, uh, especially you know, in the last five or ten years, I, I feel like I didn't want to put too much stuff on my mask. You know, I want to be able to to be clean, fresh looking, and people to just, you know see what's on there, right? And a, a lot of times, the masks are very busy, and like you're not really sure what's on it unless you get like a really up up close look. So, uh, uh, to me, you know. That's why I try to keep them as simple as possible, but at the same time make them look good. Now, is that gold plating on there right now? Like, is that, yeah. or is it yeah, just it's gold it's, leaf? Yeah. It's gold leaf, so it's actual gold. So that mask has a little more value. <laughs> yeah, but let's keep that on the down low. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so Shauna, does that mean like the guys respect? Because this is another topic around goalies all around the league. Man, buzzing the tower, yeah. headshots. We're seeing goalies get dropped by their own teammates on a regular basis. So if you throw the gold leaf up there, like, can you tell them, like, listen, guys, this is. No more, no more headshots. Or have you, at this point, earned enough respect that guys aren't buzzing the tower on a regular? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's tough to say because I, uh, you know, compare yourself to other goalies. Obviously, you get hit once in a while. I mean, guys don't do it on purpose, but you know, it's 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 tough to. You're not happy when you take one in the face in practice. You know, let's just say that. You know, we we face like uh, over 100 shots a, a day in practice, and last thing you need is some guy trying to, you know. Go bar down from, from three feet out and hit you in the face, but it's part of the game. You know, you've dealt with it your whole career. Just uh, you know, you have to understand that uh, you know guys don't go on purpose, but you obviously like to be a bit more careful. Do you? you know, I I don't want to put you in a bad yeah. spot here, so you can just decline. But do you have to lose it every once in a while? As I remember, the old school guys say like pangers, like man. He sees guys get hit like four or five times yeah. in a practice. Yeah. He's like, if we got hit once and they said sorry, no problem. Second yeah. time, you're chasing them around the ice to make sure it didn't happen. The third, is it just part of the game because we spend so much time on our knees now as goaltenders? Or do you sometimes, you know, Hopi's told me, 
him and Ovi have come to an understanding, right? And Ovi's more respectful. Yeah. Does, do you have to sort of command that every once in a while? Because it's, it's, it's become a safety issue. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for the most part, obviously you're not happy when it happens and uh, you, uh, you're a little bit upset about it. But, you know, like you just said, if it happens more than once in a practice, you, you know, a lot of times you, uh, you get fired up. So, um, you know, it's... But you're not chasing anyone around the ice. No, I haven't, I haven't chased anybody. I mean, uh, I might have yelled, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't literally physically chased anybody. Okay, well, it's a kids' show, I guess. We, yeah. we want to keep the kids involved, so we can't share what you yelled. Um, do you, just staying with gear, though, uh, you've changed some things on your pads over the years. Strapping, um, I believe you have speed skin on there now uh, in terms yeah. of sliding. Yeah. Uh, is that to me? It's always interesting when that comes from retail when they design something and you see it and then hey I, I need to add this as opposed to being the guy that drives it how what are some of the things you've tried differently from CCM over the years uh, I just whatever. composite stick too right that's yeah, another the one composite was uh, shoulder injury was the main thing yeah because of my shoulder injury I, uh, the wooden stick was a lot heavier and, and uh, I was trying to get back in the lineup and I couldn't really raise my arm because the stick was so heavy and uh I just started using a player stick in practice, and I was like, uh, felt so much easier and, and, and to, to, to move around. So I figured, why not try a, comp a composite stick? And, and once I got it, it was it was fine. I was able to return it to, to, to action. So that was how I made the switch. And, and speed. Have you noticed a difference in the speed skin with the, just a little easier slide, a little more efficient? I feel like I've had that for a long time, though. It's been. Long time I've had that. Oh, you know what? Because you probably had weave before, and then it's yeah. it's kind of a version yeah. of that. Um, skates, though, uh, we'll switch away from CCM. You have switched your skates. You were one of, I believe, we're now only two guys left. Crawford and Devin Dubnik are still in those old Reebok 9K. Not much height on them. You were one of the last, I think, last five guys. You switched last year. You went to a VH boot, yeah. super tall cowling. Um, I would think after all those years, maybe a big adjustment, but one you're never going back from, it. Eh? No, I'm not. I mean, it was, uh, my ski was so heavy. Um, it was bulky. I, I liked the stiff boots, so it was reinforced, and uh, it was really heavy. And, and, and uh, once I uh, switched over to uh, try the True, um, it was night and day. I mean, I was able to move around so much easier and, and much more, uh, around my crease and able to get to positions and not have to like lift my foot up and, and do a full like uh, quad <laughs> uh, flexion to, to be able to move around. So just that easy access to an edge, adding that height, that made a big difference for you? Yeah, actually the other thing that, that, that really, uh, to me, that I noticed a huge, huge difference is I have never blown an edge uh, when I was in, when I'm in my butterfly try to make a recovery save. It's never happened with, with the, these skates and, you know, with the other ones it would happen uh, you know, uh, once in a while because, you know, the cowling would catch or, or whatnot, but uh, these ones have never had an issue, which is great. Okay, we're back in Vancouver. We're driving back towards downtown right now. We can start to see the mountains in the backdrop, so I'm going to ask you the special memories. Like, is there a memory, as much as we're not wrapping up your career yet, but is there a memory from it to this point that jumps out for you? Is it even in this city, or is it since going back to Florida? What's uh, what are some of the moments that you reflect back on that pop up first when you think about? Well, there's there's three uh, memories that always come back to me um, the most, and, and they're all here in Vancouver. You know, um, obviously the Stanley Cup final. Um, the second one is uh, the gold medal game. You know, it wasn't the NHL, but it was in the Olympics, and it was in Vancouver, and that was obviously one of the biggest moments uh, of my career and, and for, for Canada and all that stuff. And uh, the third one is, is probably the most uh, craziest, exciting moment uh, that I've had in my whole career, which is weird to say because it was in the first round of the playoffs when we beat Chicago in overtime in Game 7. Uh, uh, you know, just if the whole setup, the scenario where they had beaten us the previous two years, and we were up 3-0 in the series, and then they came back 3-3, and then we're up 1-0, and they scored shorthanded in the third, and then they had a power play to win the game, and I made a big save, and then we Burr ended up scoring the game winner. I just remember, and I've watched a video of it once in a while, how much excitement we were. We were so happy that we won that series. Like, we, you would have thought we had won the Stanley Cup. Yeah, John Shorthouse slay the dragon call, and I think a lot of people in this market 
the first thing they remember is Burr getting out of the penalty box, yeah. coming down, puck on in, and he beats Crawford clean. And that's where the whole city just goes nuts. And I think it's still one of the favorite moments in this city. But you mentioned the save. Yeah. Not a lot of people remember that because Burrow's moment became such a defining moment. But that's the Blackhawks on a power play to win the game. I believe it's a pass out from below the net. Yeah. Low high play with some lateral element. I can't remember who it was that Char- it pinched down with a Patrick, I mean, talk about a guy who owned the Canucks yeah. back then. Walk me through that save. We'll go find some video to go yeah. with this because that uh, does that rank up there as one of the biggest saves you've made in your career, the one you remember the most? Yeah, I mean, obviously, just as far as the, the timing of it and, and, and the circumstances, uh, it was a massive save, of course. Uh, I remember, you know, I think it was Taze that had it right by the net, by the goal line, and I, I don't remember exactly how it developed, it, but I try to pass it across and I try to get a stick on it but it, I don't know if it went underneath my stick or what I can't remember exactly but uh, once it went across I saw you know Sharpie was there so I just I just slid across right away on my butterfly and I was able to get an elbow on it or an arm or, or something. And, Blocker uh, side I remember yeah, that. Yeah so um, it was nice to get rewarded with a big goal right after you know. Absolutely so and the other memory like it's funny that is such a big memory Olympics too. Yep. What do you remember of the golden goal? Like, you're at the other end. There was a big save before that after, I uh, can't remember who shot that. Was it Pavelski? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah with Scott Niedermeyer back defending and a lot tougher save than I think people in the moment realize because Niedermeyer was kind of caught in yeah. a spot that maybe screened you a little. What do you remember about the emotions of seeing Sid being at the other end as Sid puts that five hole on Ryan Miller? Uh, well, the funny thing is, is after I made that save, I was free. I was in freeze of the puck, but Niedermeyer called for it, so I just slid it to him. Or else the play would have been blown dead, and ended up bringing it in the other zone, and ended up being in the game winner. So I'm kind of glad I did not freeze that. Um, and you know, just the play developed quickly, right? It, you didn't. It was one of those where you didn't. It was kind of something made out of nothing. You know, it was an innocent play off the boards, and all of a sudden it's popped out, and, and, and that's the beauty of Sid. Like it was a deceptive, deceptive play where he just got it. You know, off the half hole and just quick, quick shot and caught Miller by surprise. So it kind of took me a second to realize what just happened, and then uh, you know, uh, after it did, I just you know, obviously you know, I go to the euphorics there. Yeah, I, I got to cover that, so that was I can relate to the emotions that went through there. Objective reporter that I am, yeah. um, still a Canadian. Uh, last one: What does the future hold when and if? you are done playing like we see a lot of guys going to coaching yeah. i have a hunch that might not be your your chosen way to go do you, do you still want to stay involved in the game how much will it depend you got a son who's eight yeah. and he plays hockey does he want to be a goalie and what does dad think of that yeah. if that's where it goes he's not right now is he no he's a forward right now so he's just uh you know he's 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 got good uh, good uh, hockey sense he's a good uh, goalie or forward so whatever he wants to do is fine and i don't want to push him to to do you know anything that he doesn't want to so uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes but uh personally i mean i don't really have any plans uh i'm definitely not you know that interested in coaching i think uh other than coaching my own son which which i i enjoy but uh, uh more of a, of a management type of guy i think uh, you know as you all everybody knows i'm, I'm big into fantasy uh, football baseball that kind of stuff I love to how, how many teams how many teams did you manage in fantasy football this year like what are you down to now? yeah I'm downgrading every year I feel like it's a little bit less this year I've only did eight eight leagues so, uh, <laughs> how yeah. many did you win none it was, been, it was a tough year so, okay sorry for bringing that up that doesn't help my chances to be, be, be in management one day but uh, you know it's just it's just something that I enjoy doing you know uh, trades uh, you know making rosters all that kind of stuff so uh you know, and obviously I follow the game. I love the game. I, I watch hockey. I, you know, I know I know everybody around the league, and, and I'm, uh, you know all that kind of stuff. So, you know, one day maybe. But uh, for right now, obviously I'm focused on on, on playing and, and playing to the best of my abilities. And, and when that day comes, you know, we'll we'll have a sit down and, and uh, see where it goes. You know, I I know my uh, wife and kids will love to have me around the house for for a while. You know, too, because uh, Daddy's been on the road a long time and. Uh, Especially this year, feels like we've been on the road all year, you know, with the Finland trip and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll make those decisions when, when the time comes. Perfect. Roberto, thanks for doing this. Speaking of sit downs, um, you know, I didn't make you hum a bar. It's not quite up to Seinfeld, but for our audience, uh, your willingness to sort of share this story and this, uh, your background and all your thoughts on the game, I can't thank you enough. My pleasure. It was fun.
that was fascinating. Darren Millard back with uh, David Hutchinson, and here is Kevin Woodley uh, after gassing up the car and making sure his tires are properly inflated. He is uh, he is with us following the the car ride with Loop. Now, I was I thought he'd be more casual, but give me an idea of of what you guys went through. Jim, not even from a from a goaltending aspect. Were you driving or was he driving? I was driving, and so. I was driving and he was holding the microphone um, <laughs> and we have a, a trip that we usually take to um, uh, when he comes into town and gives us a chance to catch up. I give him a ride somewhere and gives us a chance to catch up in the car. And so he was kind enough as, you know, it's funny, we were doing the the interview with Sonia before and then I had to go meet him and it was like, geez, we better, we got him in the car. We might as well do an interview with the guy. And to me, the, People won't know this, but why it all ties back perfectly to have Roberto on sort of our first official podcast, as impromptu as it ended up being, just a happy coincidence, the thing that got me into goaltending and writing about goaltending was an old magazine called Goalie News. And uh, it was run by Ian Clark, then the Vancouver Canucks goalie coach, now the Vancouver Canucks goalie coach. Um, but my first feature interview for his that magazine, uh, and I have it, uh, it's not up on my office wall yet, but I've got a framed sort of cover of that goalie news magazine, was Roberto Luongo back in the old Florida Panthers, 0304, the bright colors that he used to wear with the coho. Um, and it, it kind of was my introduction to this side of goaltending from a media perspective and so to have him be our our first guest is kind of a nice little synergy and we've had a good relationship and I can tell you that as we're as we got back into sort of the downtown core and we're hitting stoplights and we're kind of oblivious just chatting back and forth with him holding the microphone I, every once in a while I'd look over at the stoplight and there'd be someone in a car next to us and you could sort of see a couple of people kind of look in and you know there's these two guys with a microphone going back and forth talking and some of them kind of clue it in like is that Roberto Luongo on the so yeah we had uh, we turned a few heads we had a little fun and um as you can hear from the interview probably one of the you know truly great guys in the game and a guy who you know openly I'm, I'm supposed to be this objective reporter but the reality is I admire the hell out of the guy I had a chance to be on the ice with him this summer in Florida um and the work he puts in his passion for the game the hours he spends just to get ready to play since the hip surgery uh the amount of stretching that he has to do every day whether it's off ice or on ice work just to get ready his physically is it just shows you his passion and love for the game and I hope that came through in the interview oh it really did uh Kevin I thought it was fantastic the uh what I really enjoyed about it is that we saw every phase of what we all love about goaltending coming out in Lou, who's obviously as much a fan of the game as all of us. So that opportunity to hear him talk about his love for old gear, for old masks, to take us back to, to the driveway. Um, I, I just pictured those tennis balls rolling slowly down the driveway and hitting a pothole and coming up in slow motion and him uh, you know, loving every minute of that. Uh, it, it, it was just going back to, to everything we all love about the game and, and then also a student of the game talking talking about the RVH, which is uh, a big topic now, isn't it? I, I You know, I have to give him some, uh, some tips on how to work the microphone. I'm talking about Lou because there was a little microphone garble right when he talked about what has been the biggest influence uh, to help him from the transition from the middle of his career until now, and that was the, the adoption of the reverse VH. And I wouldn't have expected, I was thinking maybe... Uh, aggressiveness or a glove position, something like that. But but Woodley, that reverse VH has changed everything for him. Yeah, it really has. And if you remember his game, um, kind of around 2012, 2013, he was primarily uh, a, a regular VH guy, one pad up, one pad down with a lead pad up against the post. And <laughs> physically, that was a tough position for him to maintain on dead angle plays. He's, he, he, you know, if you know Roberto, he's bow legged, and being bow legged really made it tough physically for him to hold that that down pad, that horizontal pad above the goal line. And I mean, we all know VH; it still has its use in the game. We see guys like Dubnik and Lundqvist still use it effectively. Um, but it is primarily a blocking position. You you can feel a little locked into it. And for Roberto, it was that combination of getting locked into it and, and really having trouble holding it strong uh, with that backside pad. 
and teams. I remember the San Jose Sharks in one of the last playoff series he had here in Vancouver were literally just trying to take the puck to the net and jam it in knowing that they could kind of push that back pad over. And I think there's even a goal or two in that one that got called back because of early whistles or, goal, you know, you can't jam the padding kind of thing. But clearly teams had targeted it. Clearly he needed to rebuild how he handled the post. I remember having a conversation in that offseason with him where, you know, he didn't even know re- what reverse APH was. It was just coming into the game. Jonathan Quick winning a cup the year before with it. Um, and not all the coaches taught it. And so he actually went back that summer and he worked with Ian Clark in Florida and learned it, came back the next year and told Roly Melanson, the goalie coach in Vancouver at the time, like who didn't teach it, who still at that point still taught a, a traditional VH, this is how we're doing it. This is how I've learned it. Uh, this is how I'm going to do it. And now Roly, of course, teaches it as well. And, you know, it gets maligned a lot when it doesn't work. But when you hear a guy who's headed to the Hall of Fame talk about how big and how important the RVH has been to his game, yeah, I think it gives us a little perspective on uh, everybody always says, just stand up, stand up. And being on the ice with Lou in the summer, I know he was working on patience in terms of not getting into it early and not staying in it too early, not committing to it too early. But at the same time, like when it doesn't work, everybody says stand up. The reality is when guys stood up, pucks went in through their feet. When guys just used VH, for Lou especially, pucks got jammed in through their feet. Every technique on dead angle plays, and it's a hard play, that's why we have so many techniques, requires a sort of different answer, and that may depend on the goaltender. And so to just blanket RVH fail all the time, it's not the technique. Quite often it's the application or failed application of it. Or as Lou said in the interview, sometimes a guy just goes bar down from a tight spot and the kind of goal that probably goes in, even if you butterfly. And as far as just stand up, uh, you know, the last time that worked was before Patrick Waugh had success. And it's a little, it's a whole lot of confirmation bias, isn't it? I mean, we've got armchair coaches all over the internet that are looking at examples of RVH fail uh, and saying, if only you had done this. But there really are no examples of guys standing on the post now. Uh, where we have the opportunity to show where that fails as well. Uh, you just can't compare the two eras. And it's really easy to look at, at a mistake and say, if only you'd done this. But, but as Lou himself pointed out in that interview, uh, how do you know that I didn't make 10 other saves that I wouldn't have made had I used another technique? I don't want to get bogged down on the R- RVH, but uh, standing on the post, that takes us back to Murray Bannerman and that great mask. And I'm, I'm glad that Lou brought that up. Uh, he, he, he is a goalie geek nerd and and the mask part is coming into it and he he mentioned about simplifying the mask paint jobs and that's uh that's a pretty cool uh, little conversation as well oh, you, the the men's league guy though is saying when Lou mentioned pushing off the post in the RVH and having that leverage the men's league guy is is yelling going but I can't because my pegs won't stick I can there's there's no way that'll work we have a solution for that. We'll 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 tell goalies how to figure that one out. There's a little there's a company that produces some pegs that uh, I've sold a lot to NHL goalie coaches on their behalf that they use for practices when they can't get game pegs. And personally, I'm now at the point where I when I go to beer league, the referees know that I have my own pegs and they love me for it because they don't have to deal with the neck coming off all the time. So we'll 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 let people know where they can get those as well for the beer leaguers. Okay. I, I've got a couple of questions about that, too, whether or not you're going a little too far on that, but I will save it. Roberto Luongo. Oh, did you clean your car? Hey, w- Woodley, did you clean your car before you took him? No, and I agonized over it. And because, as you guys, re- I mean, quite honestly, like it was, uh, I think I got the text from him um, close to midnight the night before. They'd played in Alberta the night before, just sort of confirming, hey, what time would we have no, to go? No, 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 no. You look at the NHL schedule, you know it's a possibility. You, I know that, it's a possibility, that's but lazy. I, have a, I have a busy life. And uh, I actually, <laughs> as I was running upstairs from our Sonia DiBiase interview to go pick him up, um, one of the things I said to my wife was, ah, and expletive, I haven't vacuumed my car yet. Oh, Kevin, just be honest. Your car sits just behind your family in the order of your loves in this world, and it's always spotless. <laughs> Relatively speaking, it was clean, but it didn't have a fresh clean. Well, the car aside, we will uh, we will clean up this episode of uh, In Goal Radio, the final segment coming up as we chat about aesthetics and the look after you're traded plus a little Russian goaltending on In Goal Radio.
The look of goaltending as we continue on In Goal Radio. Darren Millard along with Kevin Woodley and David Hutchinson. As we chat about, did I, did I spell it or did I pronounce Hutchinson properly there? Because I've got two Hutches going in my head right now. Yeah, we should just leave it at Hutch because it hurts me to hear his name pronounced that way. I, somewhere back in history, his family forgot how to spell. I'm sorry about that. Michael is playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs right now after being acquired from the Florida Panthers as it all comes like six degrees of separation between uh, Roberto Luongo, CCM, and now uh, Hutchinson. So you've got a goaltender playing for Toronto, and this is a few games now where he's using uh, the, the pads from Florida. That in itself isn't isn't new, but there's a company that, that makes a, a, a great brand of product that that helps you assimilate with your team a little bit better and have the these skins, these these colors put on your pads. Hutchinson has decided not to go that route, and I reached out, and the equipment guys with Toronto said, no, we give the players the option. If they want to do it, they can, but if they don't, it's no big deal. So he's gone with this look like the 80s where you go six weeks wearing different colored equipment, the 90s. Uh, you guys uh, surprised at all about uh, where are you in the whole... OCD of, of wearing matching equipment. Yeah, I guess I'm not real OCD. I mean, but let's be honest, Mike McKenna was the other way, right? Like he arrives in Philly and they tape his whole mask black and they've got pad wrap and his Ottawa Senators pads are like yeah. killer looking Philly pads right away. So, I mean, that was pretty cool. Doesn't I don't lose it seeing a mismatch goaltender. Like I wasn't throwing up when Tim Thomas had like six different sets in Dallas that year, all kinds of different color combos. Remember when Thomas was in Dallas but with Panthers colors? Like that may have been the most fugly outfit we've ever seen. And I I, I didn't lose it, not quite full OCD. Um, but I understand that it can take time. And I know a lot of people will be like, oh, what's with the equipment manufacturer? Why is this taking so long? But people forget every piece of equipment. It's not just about making it. Um, it's about sending it to the offices in Toronto, shipping it there, making sure that it gets signed off on uh, by Kay Whitmore. We see the we see the photos of the gear with the little KW signature and a, and a, and a timeline on it. Uh, he has to prove every piece, and then it goes to the goaltender. Now, being in Toronto for Hutchison, that should be... Uh, uh, easier in terms of the offices where it gets sent being in the same city. But I can tell you there are times where um, the manufacturer posts a picture of the equipment and then we don't see the goalie in it for weeks. And part of that is the timeline getting it to him. Part of it might be a break in, but for the most part, I think it's a timeline getting it to him. We're familiar with goaltenders uh, who are happy to wear the gear right out of the box. So it's, uh, it shouldn't for most guys be a huge break in issue. Um, but it's, uh, the OCD thing really gets me. I got to say it's, uh, it's painful seeing Hutch in, in the red, uh, playing for the blue and white. Uh, I think it's fair to say though, that, uh, those pads he's wearing would be a much tougher, uh, pad wrap job than, than the guys in Philly had to go through. The other thing is he's, a. Uh... Ontario guy, Barry, and he's living out his dream of playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And you know, at the end of his career, we heard Luongo talk about it. You got these certain mementos. So he's going to have this picture of himself playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And he's not going to have matching colors for the, uh, un un unless something uh, changes. I wonder. We can Photoshop I if he's that going for him. To, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I wonder if he's just saying, I, I may not be here that long anyway until. Uh, everybody gets healthy between Sparks and 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 company, uh, or the Leafs are saying that to him. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, Braden Holpe, where are we on the cat eye conversation after he takes a stick? Now he's he's back on the ice, so that's good. Uh, it, it looks serious at the time, and and rightly so, could have been or maybe should have been serious. Where are you guys on the whole cat eye conversation? We'll start with Hutch uh, on this one. Well, it, it, I think as we said, it's uh, for those of us in the beer league, it's as much an aesthetic issue as it is anything. Uh, but if you if you grow up in in a cat eye mask, uh, it's not going to be easy to make a switch. And but I think it is uh, it is something that they're going to have to address at some point because because as we saw last night, it, it's uh, injury is a very real possibility. And now you're talking about a six to a ten million dollar goaltender who is uh, is facing a, a bit of a layoff with an injury like this that that's probably inevitable. And then you yourself, uh, Darren, brought up the issue of of uh, helmets popping off as well. So we got got a whole lot of safety issues to deal with with goaltenders and helmets. 
Yeah, I think that this is this is one that I know and have known for years. There are people in the NHL that would like to reduce the opening in the cat eye cage so that the blade of a stick can't fit through it. The fact that goalies are on their knees all the time and sticks are being waved around in front of their face so often, um, there's a little bit of surprise it doesn't happen more. We've seen some scary ones. I think Rick DiPietro back in his days with the Islanders got one on a follow through from Crosby that went right in and scratched the cornea. Um, I know the goalie union is going to push back on this. I don't see this being anything that ever happens short of a CBA uh, type of process to, to, to get a change like this, but there are people that, thing? Uh, but there are, at the end of the day, there's people that want to change and that that's all that matters. And all it's going to take is one of these to turn out as bad as it first looks, as opposed to, you know, thankfully for Braden, uh, no damage it appears and on the ice right away you know the first time we have one that goes the other way and a career ends that's when the people that have been quietly sitting there biding their time with their personal preferences in the NHL will get louder I'll wrap it up this way as long as players aren't forced to wear full, full cages the goaltenders will be allowed to wear the cat eye cages just because sticks come up and they hit players and underneath those visors. So that's the argument that they use. That's the argument they've used for, for the last number of years. The only thing that will change the cat eye opening will be if a puck goes through. And then you've got a real good argument. Uh, but until that type of injury occurs, sticks going through will, will, will never be the, the reason why that the cat eye cages go uh, Bye-bye in the National Hockey League. Now, to Russian goaltending, and normally you'd say, okay, Bobrovsky, we dealt with that. That's where you're going with this, or Vasilevsky, uh, Russian goaltenders in the National Hockey League. But, David, we have a, a story that's developing from a Russian goaltender who's very young but making a big splash. I was given a heads up by uh, Patrick Conway, who's a writer, runs a Russian hockey uh, website out of Peterborough, Ontario, of all places. And, uh, and that got me following the women's uh, U18 World Championship that just finished this morning uh, with the Canadians winning in overtime over the Americans, a fantastic final game. And, uh, and fascinating to see a 14-year-old as the starting goaltender for Russia. Um, y- you know what, what women's world championships are like. It always ends up a, a contest between the Americans and the Canadians. And uh, now Daria uh, Gredsden... Um, took the Canadians in the semifinal to overtime. Uh, she beat the Swiss in the quarterfinals in a 10-round shootout. Uh, the Swiss goaltender uh, actually named the, the top goaltender in the tournament. Uh, fascinating to see a 14-year-old doing so well. And and fair due as well to uh, the American goaler, Skyler, uh, I'm not Jesse's sister, Vetter, who uh, is only 15 years old herself and was the starting goaltender for the U.S. in winning a silver. Kevin, you've got uh, a lot of experience with the Russian uh, goaltenders as well. So any insight on that? Well, I think that I'm not surprised that Russian goaltending is good. Um, I'm a little surprised to see a 14-year-old play at a U18 championship. I mean, especially when we see just at the World Junior Championships, what I just covered. I mean, there are a lot of people that would argue the Americans' best goaltender was probably or could have been Spencer Knight, but just the fact he was 17 kept him out of the tournament. He was just there as the number three guy. So uh, we see at that tournament a, a, a sort of hesitation to play younger guys. So to see a 14-year-old at a U18 is like, wow. Um, as far as it being a Russian, like we're seeing this trend, right? We saw it at the World Junior Championships. All three of the Russian goaltenders are guys who project as and as NHL goaltenders. And sure. we're seeing that push... Oh, the obvious names, Bobrovsky, Vasilevsky. Uh, but, you know, again, to go back to Ian Clark, who I've got a good relationship with, is the Canucks goalie coach here. Through Bob, he's been to Russia a lot. Um, actually, probably in the hometown of that 14-year-old. Um, and some of the talent, he tells me, that is over there is just unbelievable. And I think the key, and there's a lesson here perhaps, is how that talent, for the most part, has been left alone. And we'll see if it continues. But two, up until the last couple of years, the, the level of goaltending coaching in terms of what we know of it here in North America, the modern game, uh, it just wasn't there in Russia. And I've talked to Hudobin about this. Uh, I've talked to Vasilevsky about this. I've talked to Bob about this. It's coming. There's more instruction over there right now than there was five years ago. But in some ways, that lack of instruction 
is what's creating this rush in the NHL to find these guys because they don't grow up being overcoached at the age of 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. They're allowed to develop a lot of raw skill, innate reads, and ability how to just sort of go out and play the game. And when you then add structure to that in the teens or early teens versus hammering that structure home from too young an age, I tell you, like there'd be a lot of goalie coaches here in North America that don't want to hear this. Um, but from the NHL perspective, they like that. They like seeing kids that have developed the ability to read without being overcoached. And then you add the layers of technique later. And some of the freak athletes that we see over there from the goaltending perspective, I mean, they're just off the charts good. And that's why you're seeing more and more teams try and discover these late round gems like Piotr Oh, now I'm going to choke on his name after saying it throughout the world. Yeah, years. But yeah, yeah. Ketchikov, undrafted in his first, like, guy gets totally undrafted last year, goes through the whole draft, doesn't get picked. Like, he's going to get picked after this World Junior Championship. And when you see him and you see the similarities to Bobrovsky and how well he moves and how he trains and the work he does, and you realize he wasn't even on NHL Central Scouting's, like, rated list in in freaking November, like, come on, like somebody's missing the boat on Russian goaltenders. And yet I was talking to an NHL goalie coach during, uh, during their game against Canada. And I know he had his staff scrambling to look at the uh, scouting reports on Ketchikov uh, right there. So ma- made a late impression. Um, one, uh, one, go ahead. Hutch. Well, well, I was, I was just going to say, um, the same coach and I were having a conversation about, uh, about this this raw talent versus uh, heavily coached youngsters in North America, and I think I think we have to be careful. Trends, the pendulum and trends swing so hard. Uh, we can't we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, here, and, and suddenly say that nobody should be coached when they're young. I think there's a real um, there's a real case to be made for periodizing your training, and that, that there's a time for working on technique, and there's a time for letting those things settle in, and kids learn how to read the game and play with their athleticism. Uh, it doesn't need to be all or nothing all the time, and and I hope people keep that in mind. I wish we had more time. We we have, we have all the time in the world. We really do. But uh, but if I don't cut you guys off, if I don't stop it. We will we will go forever. I one final note on this. Uh, I'm not sure that a 14 year old playing in a U18, as great of a story as it is, is a great testament to where your program is uh, as, as a whole. Now it might just be the the, the freaky athlete thing, and and it's a one off. But uh, well, not if the Americans just, had a 15 year old. Yeah, yeah, but if the Americans have a 15 year old and they've got a pretty developed program. Uh, Don't ruin my something. point, okay? Hutch, please, please, <laughs> I, I, please. I, please. I, do, I, I do feel bad for not mentioning, as we're talking about that, uh, let's not overlook uh, the Canadian goaltender, Reagan Kirk, in the tournament, who was the tournament MVP and a gold medalist, uh, leading her, her team to a win. Facts should never get in the way of a story, and I try as hard <laughs> as I can uh, to eliminate that. Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, we want to uh, send our, our sincere thanks to Sonia DiBiase and uh, Roberto Luongo for joining us on episode one, the first full episode of In Goal Radio. And we want to thank you, the listener, for joining us. Uh, click the subscribe button and uh, tell all your friends. This is not just for goaltending, but uh, it's also for goalie coaches. We'll have a lot of instruction down the line t- chatting with goalie coaches. So uh, we encourage you to spread the word. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Kevin. On behalf of Kevin and David, I'm Darren Millard saying uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing and make sure you keep your crease clean on In Goal Radio. <laughs>